Dear colleagues, fellow doctors, welcome to the first Cyber XFM webinar co-organized by the Wonka YD Young Doctor Movements and the Wonka Working Party on eHealth. My name is Dr. Cheryl Chen. I'm a family doctor from Hong Kong and currently the Young Doctors representative at Wonka. As you are all aware, telemedicine are becoming more and more popular, especially after the pandemic era. While virtual consultations give us convenience and help us break geographical barrier and increase healthcare accessibility, it has also introduced critical cybersecurity challenges that we must address. Therefore, the Cyber XFM webinar series is designed to equip family doctors with the essential knowledge and skills to deliver high quality primary care over the cloud in a safe and secure manner. For, uh, first of all, let me introduce our first speaker today. Uh, we are very happy to have the chair of the work Working Party on eHealth in Wonka, Dr. Anna Louisa Nevis, who is a clinical senior lecturer in digital health and the director of Global Digital Health Unit at Imperial College London. With over 15 years of research experience, she leads a team investigating innovations in digital health. Dr. Nevis is a doctor, medical doctor with specialist training in general practice. She obtained her PhD from Imperial College and has held various research roles. Dr. Nevis is an, um, now uh, currently the chair of the Working Party on eHealth in Wonka, and it is our great honor today to invite her to share her expertise on the topic, virtual consultations in primary care opportunities and challenges for better, safer, and more equitable service delivery. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, hi, Cheryl, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for the invite to join this panel. Um, it's always a pleasure just to, to, to join like-minded people to discuss uh, how uh, digital innovation is already changing the way we deliver care. Um, so on a personal note, I'm obviously very happy to have here and also from a, um, from the side of the working party on digital health. Um, we are really keen on seeing this collaboration coming to life. So thank you again, Cheryl, and uh, my pleasure, really. So I'm going to bring up my slides. Um, and hopefully share with you all um, a little bit of, reflect a little bit on the work that we have done on uh digital innovation, and most, most importantly, in this case, on virtual consultations. So I always like, so when 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 people challenge me to, this, to talk about virtual consultations, my main reflection is what is really the impact uh, of virtual consultations in current practice? Because we did embrace it globally uh, to different levels and to diff in, at a different extent, we did embrace it globally. But we still we are not still completely sure about the impact that this this has for professionals, patients, and for systems themselves. So that's why I decided to frame this presentation around uh, the impact of virtual consultations, uh, with a focus on the challenges and opportunities for the delivery of better, safer, and more equitable uh, care. Before uh, diving specifically on virtual consultations, and I'm going to share a few examples of work that we've done globally on this space. Um, I always like to start with five key messages. And to be very honest with you, these key messages, they are not specific for virtual consultations. Uh, these are high level messages that uh, from my point of view are key principles when we try to implement digital innovation or innovation in health, in health services research. So the first point that I'd like to bring uh, for discussion is that uh, this is truly a multidisciplinary and collab collaborative effort. So we have said this a lot of, times that we need multidisciplinary approaches, we need collaboration, but in digital innovation, this is particularly critical. And it's important not only to give the technology side, um, but use technology to serve a purpose. It's important to bring health services researchers, it's important to bring healthcare providers, it's important quite often to bring social sciences, user-centered research, and also, last but not least, is very important to bring on board patients and the users, which can be either patients or healthcare providers. So they need to be an active part of the process. And this needs to happen at a very early stage. So in order to uh, enhance adoption, what we don't want to do is to hand over to the user a final solution and ask them to use it. 
what we really need to do is to get them on board at a very early stage and try to test whether the solution that we're trying to push, and in this case, virtual consultations, whether it's something that they want to do, how they want to do it, and how they can this solution can fill a specific gap in the way we deliver primary care. And this is why it's really important uh, to make sure that they are brought on board at very early stages using co-design, co participatory approaches, make sure that they have a space to discuss, to share their views, and to use as much as possible those views to reshape the solution that we're trying to implement. In a specific case of virtual care, and we have seen this through the pandemic, uh, we were forced to use it in a very specific emergency setting. Uh, and after that period stopped, we need to pose ourselves the question, where do we want to still use it? We, in which circumstances virtual consultations are still helpful for which patients and in which context of healthcare settings? So it's really about understanding um, that these solutions, they more than a value on their own, they have a value as a tool to address specific gaps and specific needs of the system. So, so the exercise needs to be done in a little bit of uh, reverse engineering, really. So instead of pushing technology into the system, we need to understand that, first of all, what are the needs of the system? What are the bottlenecks? What are the struggles? And then ask ourselves whether technology, and in this specific case, virtual consultations, could be a solution to answer a specific gap or not. They might be in some cases, they might not be in others. So we need to be very mindful of those dynamics as well. And this brings me to the point about impact. Uh, and this is something that we've been really keen from a research perspective to start evaluating. Okay, so we have done it. We started to implement it. How do we actually actually measure the impact? And I really like this framework and I'll bring, I'll come back to it in a second. So this is a framework from the Institute of Medicine uh, in the United States that breaks down quality of care in six domains. I'm sure that you'll know a range of different frameworks to assess quality of care. Most of them will touch somehow on these six domains. Some will actually uh, touch less in those. So when we talk about quality and when we talk about the expected benefits or challenges of virtual consultations uh, in primary care, they might be across one of these six areas, which include patient-centeredness, and Keith is going to expand a, few, uh, a bit more on this aspect. It might be about effectiveness, clinical effectiveness, health outcomes. Do they improve? Do they get worse? It might be about efficiency, about whether the system is able to actually um, use the resources in a wiser way. Um, it might be about timeliness, about how quickly we can give access, we can give diagnosis, and we can offer treatments. And it can also be about safety of care. As you can note here, I only mentioned five uh, domains. And the reason is because I think the sixth domain actually deserves a slide on its own. And the sixth domain is equity, which is a critical aspect of quality of care. And this is particularly important in digital innovation. It has been quite discussed in the context of virtual consultations. We know by principle that whenever we implement or we try to uh, introduce digital innovation in healthcare systems, these innovations are going to be primarily and first adopted by those that already have higher literacy, higher, um, better socioeconomic backgrounds, um, and by literacy, I mean both health literacy and digital literacy. So, so this is something that all of us that do digital innovation, we are very mindful about. And there's actually a concept that you might have heard, heard about that is called digital divide. We know that once we introduce digital innovation, we are by default entrenching these existing inequities by introducing a digital solution. So we need to be very mindful of that, again, from inception. And rather than trying to correct potential uh, impacts or um, in, as I said, uh, if we try to, rather than trying to correct some inequalities that we might generate, we might we need to think about them in advance and thinking from a design perspective during design of the implementation, the solution and its implementation. How do I preempt these inequities that I know that I'm going to um, uh, to reinforce with these solutions? So ultimately, virtual care and and this is something that I'll probably bring back again as the end of the talk is just another piece of the jigsaw. And, and it's someone that has a systems thinking approach and, or that has been involved in implementation of virtual consultations will most likely tell you the vision is not for these solutions to replace completely face-to-face. -face. The challenge here is to understand 
where are they helpful, where they can be used, where are people willing to do it, and then create processes in the system so that these solutions can be placed where they are needed and we can get the most benefit out of them. So I, I always like to start the presentation just covering these five, uh, five big concepts because I think that just sets the ground for uh, how we interpret the results that I'm going to, um, to present just after. So moving into the specific results that I'd like to share with you, and hopefully we can use them as a starting point for, for discussion, uh, which I'm sure is going to be quite lively as it always is. Um, as background, one of the main things that I wanted to bring is that the concept of particularly virtual consultations and telemedicine, it's not a new concept. So this has been used for decades now. And if we look at the regions of the, the, the concept, it was actually designed and thought as a solution to bring care to areas where there were no enough resource, there were not enough resources, there were not, uh, not enough uh, providers. So telemedicine originally was a way to connect people to get advice to these underserved, remotely isolated areas. Of course, we have all seen um, and, and telemedicine, again, was already around and in many countries specifically, well, particularly uh, if we consider um, virtual consultations through telephone, that was already a reality and that was already that already had a regulatory and sometimes a legal uh, framework in many countries. What we have seen during the pandemic is that quite suddenly uh, we were rushed uh, globally to embrace it to a much um, wider scale. So the reflection that now we want to, to, to stimulate is how can we actually evaluate the impacts of these virtual consultations for these aspects of quality of care? And the results that I'm going to show, they cover pretty much these six areas in different, um, in different uh, depth. Another reflection that I'd like to make here and again, I'm, I'm just jumping out of the virtual consultations concept to the wider concept of digital innovation is that we need to be mindful that certain solutions, digital solutions, they are, uh, well, a specific solution is not likely to improve all these six domains of quality of care. So it might improve, for instance, timeliness. It might be, uh, it might allow users to get easier access to care, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will improve clinical outcomes or safety or equity. So we need to be very balanced in the way we evaluate the different impacts. And we need to be very mindful as well that the levels of impact across these domains is going to vary according to the solution. So I'd like to share with you after this uh, brief intro, I'd like to share with you some of the results of uh, one of our um, flagship studies at the Working Party on ELs. And we performed this in 2020. And I remember um, when this was very early, so March 2020, when we started having discussions with colleagues globally, um, there was obviously this anxiety and this uh, burden of a very complicated uh, time to deliver care. But at the same time, there was this perception, um, we, were, we are changing quite a lot the way we are delivering care. How can we actually capture insights from those in the ground and try to learn from those experiences? And that's how we started this survey. So we started um, originally with a small cohort of 20 countries, um, and then we expanded to different regions um, all over the place. As you can, so this is actually not the last. Um, so at the moment, so these are the countries that involved in the first study. And actually now we have expanded to 35 countries, which are much, much stronger uh, representation for uh, from Africa region, for instance. Um, but this allowed us to tap into those countries and to ask GPs, how is the experience and how can we learn from it? So what we did back then, um, we were very lucky to have a range of partners, national leads in each one of those countries, and they helped us recruit um, and ask GPs in each one of those countries if they could fill a survey that would cover mostly three big sections. So one section was about who are you and what's the setting in which uh, you are working. So that means knowing more about not only the physicians that are asking these, but also about the digital maturity, uh, use of electronic health records and digital landscape in those countries. And we use that to publish a, a range of separate papers. And then the second part was about how did you use virtual consultations during the pandemic? How many time did you spend doing it? What was the impact? Um, and the third part was about how do you want to use this moving forward? And these are the results that I'm going to share with you now. 
So this gives you a bit of an idea of the sample that we got here. So relatively balanced uh, in what concerns age, gender. Um, we have 60% from our urban setting and the remaining uh, split between rural and mixed. So we had quite um, a relatively diverse coverage. And then we ask them, how much time do you spend doing each one of those? Again, this is not surprising, but what's surprising is that the change in the pattern. So what we asked them was how many hours do you spend in each one of these technologies before the pandemic or after the pandemic? And as you can see here, these uh, red blocks of the bars, which represent the proportion of doctors that wouldn't spend any time with those technologies, reduced significantly for all of those options. So that includes telephone consultations, that includes chat consultations, video consultations, online triage, remote monitoring technology. So it was a, a, an overall trend. The one that actually uh, has seen a, um, a more drastic change was video consultations. The reason being, as I said before, because telephone was already relatively well adopted. As you can see here, 27% uh, were already using it. So if we compare telephone by, uh, with video, video seems to have uh, experienced a greater adoption because it was coming from a much lower starting point anyway. The second thing that we asked them was, okay, so what about the impact of um, virtual consultations on the quality of care? Is this affecting it positively or negatively? So we created a range of statements which were informed by the framework that I shared, trying to cover different aspects, including uh, safety, effectiveness, uh, timeliness, and equity. And um, the, I would say the least exciting, because this was already expected result, was that one of the main benefits or the highest um, or the item that showed the highest proportion of, of GPs um, reporting a positive impact was obviously the one re related with the pandemic. They would say, okay, yeah, this had a massive effect, a massively positive impact preventing the pandemic. And that we already knew. What we didn't know, knew, uh, we did, what we didn't know, and it was a bit of a surprise, was that actually quite a high number of uh, GPs already said, well, this could be actually a good solution to remotely delivery care for preventative care, chronic conditions, and even minor illnesses in primary care. So this was already gearing us into potential benefits that would go beyond this emergency response. Um, the, the aspect that uh, unsurprisingly gave us the um, higher percentage of um, doctors uh, saying that the impact negative would be a little bit higher was in what concerns equity, as I discussed before, and again, linking to the concept of digital divide, and are we able to provide this equitably to our patients, or are we leaving someone behind? So we published this, and, and uh, I'm very happy to share the, the, the resource if you'd like. I, I'll leave my, my email and my contact at the end if someone wants to discuss further. So we published these results and tried to map them, these major impacts. As part of this section in which we ask people about the benefits and challenges of virtual care, we actually let them write down as a free text uh, what were their main um, identified benefits and challenges. So we wanted to go into a deeper understanding of how did these GPs and primary care providers experience the use of virtual consultations. So talking about the main benefits, one of the main things, and here we group these in benefits for providers, systems, and quality of care, which is mostly benefits for patients. So for systems, the biggest message was that this gave a push to the digital transformation that we had, we wouldn't have seen otherwise, or we wouldn't have seen uh, at such a speed. And it actually forced the system to change their legal and regulatory frameworks. So as I mentioned before, in some countries, it was already legal and possible, and you know it was part of the, the offer of care, virtual consultations, including video or telephone. But in many countries, this sort of delivery of care was not even considered, was not under any kind of legal framework, and those that would practice it would be playing in a very gray area with, you know, obviously the uh, with um, with the associated risk in what concerns if something goes wrong and if there's a misdiagnosis or a mistreatment. So these were the main benefits. So it actually changed the way we deliver care. It opened our eyes to a new um, way of delivering care, and it actually forced the systems to adapt. Providers would say, okay, now I have something uh, different that I didn't have before, which is the ability to work remotely. 
And in some countries, these actually um, created new platforms that providers would use to um, access, uh, for instance, to make their uh, to make e prescriptions and to access um, their patients' data while they were in their home uh, homes. And then we have all the aspects about quality of care. So that means um, that they were able to map a range of potential benefits uh, that included more convenience, more communication, uh, easier accessibility, um, and they mentioned very specifically the um, advent of remote triage as a new tool to prioritize patients that need to come face to face or can be seen uh, offline. So these are the main benefits that were mapped. And I really like to share these results, the, the actual sentences with you, because I think that gives us the level of nuance that we see in our clinical practice. And there was something that I really enjoyed about, the, and sorry, I, I didn't reinforce uh, an important thing here, which is about equity. So one of the things that was a little bit of a surprise was that we were hoping, well, we were expecting to see people raising the issue about digital inequity and saying, look, a lot of people are left behind. What we were not expecting was that some doctors would actually say, because now I'm able to do telephone consultations or I'm doing them more often, I'm actually, as you can see here in this first sentence, I'm actually reducing inequities because I can provide care for those work or for those elderly people in remote areas that would need to come for a consultation. And now I can actually talk with them on the phone. So this was a bit of an unexpected and positive thing. So GP is actually bringing the positive impact on equity that we were not really uh, waiting for. Um, and I think this second sentence here is the second one that I will highlight. Um, I think it's it's really strong and I think it does uh, show the impact um, of the pandemic hastening the digital transformation. We have this doctor from Sweden saying, well, actually working through video consultations ended up being a quite positive experience and I would have never have tried it if I was not forced to do it through this context. So these are some examples and some stories that I found uh, particularly interesting. And, and I think it's always good to listen to the people's you know, voice rather than just looking at the data and at the numbers. Talking about the challenges. So again, we map the challenges across these three big areas. So challenges for systems, these are not a surprise for anyone that has been working in the front line. So the systems were not ready, the culture, the technological aspects, the implementation was rushed, the financial issues. So we couldn't have expected it otherwise, really, because it was an emergency response. But now, now that we know the barriers, is the time to actually uh, start adjusting to those barriers. Providers, again, many of these challenges are related to the specific context of this implementation, remuneration issues in some countries, um, telephone and video consultations were not considered proper clinical acts. So there was not a payment or co-payment associated, higher burnout and lack of guidance and, and support. Talking about the challenges for quality of care. So we have already discussed the aspects about patient centeredness and how that could impact the relationship with the patient. We already discussed the issues with digital literacy, patients not having sometimes the skills, the access, or the willingness to use it. And for those patients, an appropriate uh, response needs to be, or an appropriate option needs to be given. Um, and I'm going to focus here on the safety, uh, because this was one of the main things that actually uh, was raised by this study, was that people were not actually completely uh, against the idea of doing virtual consultations for patients that would like to and patients that um, could be seen in the virtual consultation. But the main problem was that, uh, and you all know, working in primary care, uh, we work um, by default in a quite uncertain setting. Quite often in many countries, we don't have access to quick tests or quick diagnostic uh, examinations. So we do, we are used to work on this space. But virtual consultations actually remove one of the main tools, which is physical examination that help us to cope with that uncertainty. So for GPs, for family doctors and general practitioners all over the place, the absence of that physical examination and the increased clinical uncertainty and the risk of misdiagnosis and mistreatment was actually one of the strongest concerns. So what they wanted to know and what we still need to know is how can we operate in this space in a way that is safe, 
in a way that I know clearly which patients can be seen remotely and patients can be seen face to face. What is the safest option? How can I get guidance to allow me to make those decisions in a better way and a safer way as well? So you can see some, some examples here. Again, as I said before, some codes from the, the participants that we engage with, um, highlighting the difficulty, the, the increased difficulty of making decisions over the phone without access to physical examination, which we know can now be somehow um, overcome with use of technology, but is not, as you'd all agree here, is not going to be the same thing. And also the risk of misdiagnosis and mistreatments uh, that are associated to this lack of, um, uh, without uh, having access to a physical examination. So the obvious question here, when we did this work, and this, just to be very transparent, we were aware that this survey was not perfect, was running during the pandemic with a convenient sample. It was what was possible in, to capture information in a very tricky time. You might even argue, was it ethical to reach out to people um, to, to ask them for an additional survey at this stage? Anyway, we had such a good response and people were so interested in the topic that we moved into the next step, uh, next step which was, okay, what is the patient perspective? Because as I said in the beginning, that's great to understand how is the prof professional's perspective, how have they coped with it, but did patients actually engage with it? So we ran a separate survey uh, to, uh, to look at the patient's perspectives and running basically the same questions with some adjustment. And we found very, very similar uh, findings. So we did validate those findings. So one of the things, and I just like to share with you these two resources because they are quite uh, practical. So one of the things that we were really keen on doing was uh, making sure that this research wouldn't keep stuck in our drawers or stuck in these academic journals that we all read academics, but probably general population and external stakeholders won't read it. So we made sure that these results were embedded in white papers, policy reports and guidance. And if you want to, to, to read more about it, uh, you can find some information in this report that we wrote with the OECD about the uh, future of telemedicine and the next steps moving forward. And also in this WHO uh, learning brief so for context, um, WHO has created a resource, uh, which they called back then the COVID Learning Hub, in which they would uh, store materials that they would find um, relevant uh, as guidance for uh, people trying to implement such solutions. So we delivered a short version of this academic paper as a learning brief, um, which is now stored in this uh, service as well. So ultimately, what we wanted to do is to try to get a tool. And we wanted to uh, take all this knowledge that we gathered from those working the front line and also from patients and create a tool that people could use to reflect um, when they want to introduce virtual consultations, which aspects need to be considered. Uh, and after they introduce these virtual consultations, how could they assess if they are doing this to the best standard possible? So we created this framework that you can see here that basically maps all the things highlight, highlighted by patients and providers and creates these, I, I don't want to call it a checklist because it's not intended as a checklist, but creates these, um, this structure that you can use to make sure that uh, the main aspects that include context, technology, awareness and experience, safety uh, management and strategic planning are covered. So we created this framework and we are now working. As, so this is our last project. We are uh, working on turning this academic output into something that physicians can actually use in a more user friendly way. We know it's very heavy, we know it's ugly. So we are working with physicians actually to do um, a prioritiz prioritization exercise of what needs to be there and in which format do, we, do they want to receive these to actually be a useful tool for them. So this is the last stage of the project in which we are now working. So one of the main problems, as I highlighted before, of this uh, initial survey is that it didn't really have a global scope. So we had 20 that then expanded to 25 countries, but, but the representation from all regions was not the same. And that was really from a practical reason, because back then we just tried to uh, speed it up as soon as possible. And we started creating the links as we, as we go. 
So as part of that process, and because we realized that there were important gaps, um, and there are important gaps in this work, we established a partnership with the Africa Telehealth Collaboration and with Afro PHC, which you might have heard about, um, to expand the reach of this work to, um, to the Sub-Saharan Africa region. So we've worked with this list of organizations um, from both Afro PhD and the African Telemedicine Collaboration to try to understand the same thing. So what are the needs? And I'm going to go back to my first point when I started this conversation. It's not about technology. It's about how is the system there? What are the needs? And where does technology can play a role? So we did this exercise with a range of partners uh, through these two organizations. And we produced this report, which it was an amazing experience for us to do. Uh, it was very collaboratively collaborative. And uh, as part of that process, we mapped case studies um, in, sub in Africa sub-Saharan region um, that can support cross-learning. So this is one of the examples. This is uh, um, an e-appointment system uh, in a practice in South Africa where they use uh, digital innovation, remote technology, actually, to... Um, help patients and support patients creating appointments and getting initial assessments. So if you are interested in this uh, specific uh, area of study, I'm very happy to share it with you. And I think it ended up as a, as a quite interesting resource. Just to finalize, um, four years after the pandemic, now we have time and now there is a lot of research done on this subject. Uh, actually measuring impacts. So one of our last paper was uh, a systematic review bringing together everything that was uh, published, evaluating the impact of virtual consultations in primary care. So we published these last year, and these are the main results. So as you can see here, we started with quite a bit of paper, so a little bit over 6,000. Uh, we ended up including 30 studies for the systematic review itself. And what we found is particularly if you look at these six domains that I mentioned, thinking about clinical effectiveness, thinking about health outcomes, for several, several conditions, the ones included in the, in the systematic review, and that includes mental illness, smoking cessation, alcohol consumption uh, advice. For these cases, actually, consultations were not inferior to face-to-face -face care in what concerns health outcomes. There's a huge gap on safety. So evidence on safety is extremely limited. We don't have enough papers to actually look at it. And this is a critical need from a research and policy perspective. We need to understand who is being unsafely treated potentially with this sort of uh, service delivery model. Um, looking at patient centeredness, there was overall, uh, so four out of five studies demonstrating positive impacts, but again, the number is relatively low. And uh, timeliness and equity showed mixed method, mixed results, so we couldn't really make a call. So the strongest impacts are actually on the clinical effectiveness, um, and there's this call for need of more safety studies. So where do we move from here? Um, and I'll just leave these three key messages. Um, in primary care and in health services research, numbers only tell us part of the story. So we do need to be quite mindful. Um, and as I just I just shared with you, we need to have numbers to show clinical effectiveness. We need to have some numbers to show experience, but we need to go back to the ground, talk with patients, talk with users to understand what is the impact of the solution. And the other aspect is we need to actually look at use usability and uptake because it doesn't really matter if a solution is really efficient, if it improves clinical outcomes, or if it's actually safe, if people don't use it, or if people are not willing to use it in a sustained way. Um, so, so that's an important aspect that we need to incorporate in research. It's not just about effectiveness, it's not just about impact, it's also about whether people are willing to take this on board. That brings me to the second point. Do patients want it? Do patients have the access and skills which are related to literacy? But more importantly, even if they have the, will, the, the willingness and the skills, they might not want to do it. And that's fine. Patients' preferences should be uh, prioritized always. And they we need to understand that they might be dynamic. Patients might want a certain type of consultation in a certain context, and they might change it for another one. So we need to understand how do we accommodate for these dynamics um, in patients' preferences as well. And the last one is how do we support those that want to be supported? 
That includes supporting patients that want to uh, improve their literacy skills, their digital literacy skills, and how we use the network around uh, those patients to support their increased use. So I think that's pretty much the results I wanted to share with you, Cheryl. Uh, uh, Cheryl, I think I'm still on time, hopefully, um, and I'll probably stop here and uh, hand over to yourself and Keith. Thank you very much, Dr. Anna. It was an excellent presentation and it's very inspiring. Um, it is very important for us to know that telemedicine does not only provide convenience to us, but also improve the health equity. And it's very interesting to know that most GP found actually positive impacts on the quality of care. And it's important to know uh, for us to acknowledge the limitation of telemedicine and also um, to improve our uh, digital literacy of our patients and also of um, the healthcare providers our own to use our uh, technology safely. Uh, so um, now uh, let's welcome our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Keith Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a family physician from Ontario. He's an adjunct family pro a faculty professor in the departments of family medicine in Western University, and also serves as the associate director of the Research Institute for Earth and Space. He has extensive experience in telemedicine and digital health. His presentation today will focus on the implications of the McWinney principles for primary care in light of emerging digital health technologies. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Cheryl, and thank you, uh, Anna Luisa. Appreciate being here today and really appreciate the work that uh, you and the others within Wonka have done. <laughs> I can honestly say as a family doc times 30 years, this has saved me from burnout. I'm a late bloomer to technology and the research that goes around that. One of the things that really helped me through the pandemic, uh, what started as an emotive email to my former staff people about, you know, what are we doing? We're separated from our patients. There's no contact. We're in this terrible mess. You know, what is family medicine all about? And I found myself going back to what were, in my day as a resident, assigned readings, you know, required elements of my training to learn of the work. And actually, uh, Dr. McWinnie was one of our professors at the time. If you're not familiar with his work, please take a moment to look up. He is really the founding father of family medicine. Uh, he was trained in the UK, came to Canada, and, and established recognizing that family medicine was uh, a specialty unto its own in being a, a generalist. We know a little bit of everything, and some of us are very expertise. Some of us has expertise in anesthesia or a, in eMERGE work and palliative care. But really the foundation of his work and what brought us to the forefront and uh, has helped us become the building block of any healthcare system, the relationship with our patients, long-term, longitudinal. And I'm sure many of you can relate that you have patients that now you're seeing uh, the children or even the grandchildren of those families. Uh, Dr. McWinnie described some foundational principles uh, around family medicine. And just to highlight on, on these and then bring it back to, uh, I will, in relation to what we've been talking about in the digital realm, because most of these uh, principles he founded in an era where we were just early on in electronic records. And so digital health, as we know it today, was far different than in Dr. McWinney's era. In visiting our patients, one of the things that he often referred to was the taxonomy of visits. Why is a patient before us? And often it falls into one of five categories. The limit of tolerance, the pain, the itch, the hurt. It's bothering them so much they need relief from a symptom. The limit of anxiety. I'm worried that spot my brother had was a cancer or this pain or this lump. Is it, a, is it a, something serious? Heterothetic problems, uh, problems of living. So the parent who's stressed out at home, financial needs overwhelmed, they're coming in with abdominal pain or a headache. And we as family doctors are the best ones to scratch down and discern what are some of the problems that maybe bring them. They're before us for a medical reason, but truth is there may be something else behind this. And preventative care, uh, immunizations, well baby checks. And lastly, an administrative uh, duty, which might be a sick note or needing a form fill. Now take each of those reasons or needs and put this into the digital realm now. 
certainly for administrative duties, a telephone call or a text message to fill out a form that now can be sent back and forth. We can uh, relate to our patients. So we have systems integrated into EMR to help us relate and send them their needs uh, for notes, et cetera. Um, limit of anxiety, quick story. One of my patients, terminal cancer, and we're still in the midst of the pandemic. And she was having some difficulty with sleep and really uh, it's a lot of anxiety and worry about her condition. I spoke to the daughter and said, hey, we can do a video call. It sounds like there's mostly mental health issues. Called the patient, talked to her, said, got the story. Look, why don't we set up some visits by video call? You and I can chat. I see you're having trouble with sleep. You're worried about your condition. Oh, doctor, she says, I really want to come to see you. In subsequent visits, I palpated for lymph nodes and I'm listening to her lungs, which seemed to me from the efficiency or the scientific side of what I did, a futile effort. I knew she was dying, but she needed that hands-on for her. It was the only thing that could be dealt with face-to-face. -face. She needed that. So I would challenge each of us to say, when we look at the use of a digital, digital tool or virtual visit, are we addressing those needs? And nextly, uh, the foundational or the mission statements of family medicine. And I won't go through them all for the sake of time, but you can see going through these again. For example, as family doctors, we see patients in their homes. Well, what does that look like now in the context of wearables or uh, other technologies? Maybe it's a visit by proxy. We have a community paramedic or community health worker doing those visits. What if the patient doesn't have a home? and addressing some of those issues uh, of equity. What might that look like? Um, you know, there's uh, many of these things that we can look at and say, okay, what does this look like within the, within the digital realm? And, and I think it's gonna be very important as we move forward, you know, as family doctors, we thrive on the efficacy the relation between our patients, those holistic aspects of care. Uh, and we can't forsake, and I know Anna has spoken to this, and that's why I'm excited about the, the work that she's doing, uh, that this is still a core ingredient. If we lose this, we really do, I think, devalue uh, who we are as physicians. And I'm just going to finish with a quote. Marshall McLuhan, who is a thought leader here in Canada, who said that the age of technology, be, uh, the age of technology, will be the age of do it yourself. And how far do we want to go in removing ourselves from those contacts with the patients and move to modalities where very much it may be about the technology, about the diagnoses, the ICD code, but let's not lose uh, touch with the holistic and compassionate side of what we do as family docs. That's it uh, for my chat folks. Uh, and, and I look forward to hearing the, the rest of the session today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, for your insightful sharing. And it's very important for us all family doctors to remind, uh, uh, to bear in mind that um, we are often the most, at uh, the first point of contact for our patients and the principle of family medicine that we are practicing. And it is um, important for us to remember um, how to deliver a patient-centered care with compassion and also um, with uh, sometimes, as uh, Dr. Thompson said, a magical touch with the patient might be what they uh, just need. So um, this brings us to um, inviting our uh, next speaker, our final speaker, uh, who is Mr. Horace Aoyun from Singapore, in, uh, from the Interpol. Um, Mr. Aoyun is the coordinator of the Asia South Pacific Desk in Interpol's Cybercrime Directorate. Mr. Aoyun brings a wealth of expertise and authority on the critical issue of cybersecurity. With a master's degree in computer science from the University of Hong Kong, Mr. Aoyun has the technical knowledge and understanding to shed light on the cybersecurity threats that we face in the realm of telemedicine. Given Interpol's role as the world leader in um, cybersecurity governance, we are privileged tonight to have him to share his insight and guidance on how we as family doctors can better protect our patients and our practices from the evolving dangers in the digital healthcare landscape. Um, welcome, Mr. Aoyun Horest, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Cheryl Chen, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, 
everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, really nice to meet you. Um, this is Horace Oya. As uh, introduced by Dr. Chen, I'm uh, now the coordinator of Asia and South Pacific Desk Cybercrime Directorate in Interpol. Um, actually, I'm a police officer. I'm a chief inspector, um, seconded from the Hong Kong Police Force. And now uh, I'm now in uh, Singapore, uh, IGCI, um, Interpol um, Global uh, Center for Innovation. Um, so I stationed in Interpol for two years. So today, uh, um, it's really my pleasure to present this topic on behalf of Interpol and um, we can have better coordination with Wonka and uh, y YDM as well. And I hope that um, by this uh, sim uh, uh, presentation, um, I hope you can know more, uh, you have more understanding about the cybersecurity incidents, the issues and preventive measures and etc. So um, before I start today's agenda, let me have a few minutes very quickly to um, go over the role of Interpol in combating cybercrime. So uh, as you may know, Interpol is the largest well organization that we have over, uh, uh, we have altogether at this stage, 196 member countries. And um, we have four um, global programs to, uh, tackling uh, different kinds of uh, crimes around the world, which including counterterrorism, organized and emerging crimes, um, financial crime and anti-corruption, and last, last but not least, cybercrime. So for uh, our goal four of Interpol GoPro policing goals, um, we wish to uh, secure cyberspace for people and businesses. And of course, um, um, family doctors are one of the businesses. So um, I hope that I can um, um, deliver more information to all of you. So within uh, Interpol um, Cybercrime Directory, we have our own strategy. Um, so the mandate is to reduce the global impact of cybercrime and protecting communities for a safer world. Um, as you may know, in internet connects everyone, including you and me tonight, today. So um, we really need to take care of our uh, cyber safety. And for combating cybercrime, we have uh, Four objectives here is uh, to make it simple, um, which including intelligence, um, um, operations, and capabilities development, as well as partnership. So um, let's kick start today's agenda. Um, I will highlight some of the challenges uh, in cybersecurity for telemedicine. But actually, I would say it's not only uh, related to telemedicine, but related to all of us, uh, i.e. the internet user. And secondly, uh, I would like to uh, highlight some cybersecurity incidents that you may um, face in the future, but hopefully not. Uh, and, maybe, and then uh, I also uh, provide some uh, advice to you all. And then um, at the end, we have a conclusion and Q&A session. So first of all, let's see this uh, table. Um, the ch challenges in cybersecurity for telemedicine. Uh, or actually not telemedicine, but um, internet users. So you can see um, for the worldwide um, cyber security incidents, uh, how many times that uh, you need to detect it. And for example, it, um, it takes uh, within 24 hours to detect the incident. Uh, it's only around uh, one third, less than one third of incidents. And at the last row, you can see that 30% um, over uh, incidents that actually uh, no one discovered it. Um, so by this survey, you may uh, know that it really takes time for um, the users to identify that uh, something really happened or really to deal with it. So um, for the organization, for example, like a hospital or a clinic, uh, uh, healthcare center, etc. I suggest all of us need to put some um, resources, put some budget for cybersecurity because the consequence of not uh, taking care of the cybersecurity is uh, you, you cannot imagine. For example, um, um, one cyber attack may ruin your whole business, may ruin whole the 
the whole organization um, um, may wound the trust uh, between the doctor and the patient. So that the slogan here I highlight is uh, quite meaningful. Securing tomorrow starts today. That's why um, if you're a managerial level, uh, if you have the ability to allocate the resources, please put some um, resources like money or infrastructure to uh, secure the cyberspace and the infrastructure. All right, so um, let's highlight some uh, incidents here. The first one is um, data leakage. So um, as a doctor, I believe most of you must uh, have chance to handle different kind of um, data, such as the personal data of the patients, um, the medical history, the med uh, the family backgrounds, etc. So that those data actually are very uh, important, right? And, but as you can see, there are many uh, cases that uh, those data are leaked on the internet. Some some data were sold by the hackers or um, even published on the internet and you can freely download them, uh, which may cause huge impact to the uh, data owner. And then uh, what data actually include in those uh, leakaged uh, files or database? Uh, you can see that, um, so for example, personal data, like your email or mobile phone, your address, or those medical history, or even some confidential information or sensitive data. For example, it will uh, draw the global attention. If you know some uh, uh, country leader may have some kind of uh, illnesses, right? Um, so we need, really need to take care about the uh, data that we have. All right, the next one is uh, malware or ransomware attack. And then, um, so um, I believe most of you may uh, using computers or digital devices um, on your daily work. And um, it's, if your device is being hacked, um, also will bring you huge impact or embarrassment. Um, for example, uh, uh, you cannot um, operate as uh, normal as you should. And then, um, so for example, when you when your device is affected by the ransomware attack, um, your, your operation system cannot work or you cannot access those files because the files were encrypted um, by the hackers using the uh, very complicated Agrofrom. Um, even using super computer can need to, lots of time to try to decrypt the uh, encryption. So that's why the hackers have the uh, uh, bargaining power to ask for the ransom. Um, and nowadays most likely uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum and etc. Okay, but uh, even though you pay for the ransom, do you think that um, those hackers would really help you to decrypt your device? Most probably not. So um, prevention is uh, more important, right? Um, the next attack is a phishing attack. No matter uh, it's received by your mobile device in SMS or um, it is in your email boxes, you can see some hyperlinks um, just like here, uh, some example. Um, will you really wish to click on it? The link may bring you to the genuine uh, destination, but what if they're not? They may bring you to the fraudulent websites or uh, request you to um, input some um, personal data or credit card information and etc. So um, one prevention uh, tips here is think twice. Don't trust what you see. You need to verify, you need to check before you really click on the link. And you can find in the search engine, there are a couple of uh, useful platforms can help you to check the URLs before you really uh, click on it. 
you can simply copy the hyperlink and then put into this uh, um, searching machine and then um, they will verify the destination for you. So once you uh, double confirm and you have more confidence to click on it, otherwise you, you will never know um, the destination of hyperlink. All right, uh, the next one is the um, insecure system or devices or network. So um, for telemedicine, you must need the device, you, you must need to set up the application and also you need the uh, connection to the internet. So there are many different settings, configurations. Um, you need really, really need to pay uh, attention for example, the operating system, is it up to date? There are many loopholes uh, discovered by um, various users day, uh, day by day. And then, um, for example, the network of your organization, are there uh, sufficient uh, uh, protection like the firewall, like the uh, protected uh, internet connection, etc. cetera? Um, the hackers, they may find a loophole to um, go into your device and try to explore uh, vulnerabilities in your devices in order to, you know, earn money at the end or uh, destroy um, your systems. Okay, this is a, a, a funny uh, technology. We call it fake and uh, with the uh, uh, AI technology. So here, uh, Tom Cruise, actually not Tom Cruise, right? Uh, from on the left-hand side, okay? It's a, a gentleman. But after you adopting the different technology, calculate uh, the uh, reference points on his face, and then you, the system can, you can simply imagine paste the face of uh, Tom Cruise, so he can pretend to be Tom Cruise, right? Um, here, okay, for telemedicine, um, in, in front of the screen, can you confirm actually who is the patient on your screen? Is it Mona Lisa or Brad Pitt? Um, so uh, I, I can also uh, highlight another, uh, advice for you because this technology uh, the computer was trained to do different kind of calculations simultaneously like um, calculate the different shapes shadows uh, different angles of the face and then um, compile it and then uh, put it on the original face so um, the system need to be trained for example, provide sufficient information of the uh, uh, avatar, I would say, and then so the uh, system can replace the face. And how can you discover it, whether it is a real person or is the person adopting different technology? Actually, you can ask um, the person in front of the screen to do some action. For example, use your finger to touch on the nose or um, stand up or bring your eyes and see if there are anything uh, uh, different or uh, abnormal. So if you ask the person to do such action, um, if it's really adopted deepfake technology, the, the face will be unnatural or you can see some uh, 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 errors around the edges. Um, I although uh, um, it's not very popular, uh, uh, but uh, we can imagine uh, um, if the telemedicine becoming more popular, you may uh, face such uh, uh, problems maybe within a few years later. Yeah. So um, after I highlight some uh, um, incidents here, uh, for law enforcement agency, we have a cycle to do that. Um, the key security measures to mitigate cyber threats. First of all, we need to detect 
what threats we have. And then um, we need to respond to such incidents. And then um, we also need to do the damage control and do the investigation, do the evidence preservation. And if possible, we can arrest the uh, suspect behind the scene, uh, behind the screen. And then um, at the end, the uh, infected, the affected company uh, or organization, they can recover from the attacks. So this, this cycle, um, I believe uh, most IT staff would uh, know about that. And for you, there, there are some um, uh, tips I highlight. First of all is the um, designated device for telemedicine. Make sure you are not mixing up the official uh, device with your personal device. Because um, let's say inside the organization, um, your company may have uh, different um, policies. Um, so, um, and also the device may store some confidential information as I mentioned before. Uh, make sure that uh, do not mix it up. And then the second one is uh, use the secure password as well as the multi-factor authentication policy. Um, do not use very simple password because uh, we, uh, you may know the hackers can use dictionary attack or brute force attack to guess what password you use. It's very easy to hack into your system if the password is very simple. And also multi-factor uh, of location is more difficult for the hackers to hack into the system because um, let's say the program need to uh, use your password and also, let's say your fingerprint, your token, um, hardware or software. So uh, it's more difficult to hack in the system. And then um, I, I think I don't need to say, but you need to do is to regularly and timely uh, update your operating system, your applications, because those are let pop up because they find um, there are some loopholes or uh, malfunction for the applications. You need to update them timely to make sure that your device, uh, your application are secure. And staff training on cybersecurity protocols. I think different uh, um, organizations must have different kind of um, protocol or guidelines, how to use your digital device, how to um, connect to the internet, um, are you allowed to use your personal mailbox um, during um, uh, your official purpose, something like that? Make sure you understand the protocols. And next one is secure data storage. So um, for the uh, one scenario, if you save, in, save the file inside a USB drive, the USB from drive, um, do you know that some of the USB have the function of encryption to protect um, the data stored inside the USB. So touch wood if you lost the USB from drive because uh, 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 it's protected, all right? So um, someone may uh, grab it and try to open the USB, but they cannot because they don't have the decryption method. They don't have the password. So they, they cannot access the file stored inside the USB. And um, also do not try to upload the files um, to the public cloud, which is not allowed by your organization because you never know the security level of the private cloud or the public cloud. Instead, only store the file in the location which is uh, authorized by your organization. Make sure that uh, those files will not leak to uh, unwanted person. And then uh, as the organization, you may need to consider which one or which person should have the uh, authority to assess what kind of information, what kind of files to make sure that uh, it's 
uh, under need to know basis. And then uh, implementing end-to-end -end encryption um, and secure the network. So it's a, uh, uh, I think it's rely on the uh, IT staff of your organization. So uh, but it's just uh, preventive tips. And um, to conduct regular security audits to check whether um, the system, the networks are in good condition, um, no chance for the hackers to you know steal your um, data or try to um, ruin your system, etc. And then um, and other prevent preventive measures is to uh, establish an effective incident response. So how we can do that? As I mentioned, we need some guidelines to know about it. And from time to time, we need to do regular um, cybersecurity drills or tabletop exercise to simulate the incident. For example, uh, once your device was, was uh, infected by the ransomware, what you should do uh, immediately or what you who you need to inform or um, what action you need to perform, etc. So make sure you understand what to do um, before the incident really happened. So give you a taste and um, um, you know what to do if it really happens. And as I quote, practice makes perfect. So um, I think it's almost the end of my presentation, but I just highlight the red trust. Um, in law enforcement agencies, I also highlight to um, different um, police officers around the world that we need trust to share intelligence, to conduct joint operations. So adopting the same work to um, family daughters, trust, mutual trust is very important as well between the doctor and the patient. So um, you need to gain trust from your patient so that they can disclose um, the information to you through the internet, through the telemedicine. So you need to make sure that the connection between you and your patient is safe. And that's why I highlight this work. And um, so if you have any question, please feel free to ask or uh, you can simply drop me an email. I'm more than happy to uh, get connected with all of you. And once again, thank you very much for Wonka and um, Wonka YDM provide me such a um, very valuable opportunity to present with all of the uh, family daughters. It's really my pleasure uh, um, to, to uh, do this presentation to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Horace, for your insightful lecture and tips to all of us. And uh, may we highlight that uh, patient identification is very important. The Mona Lisa, like, I, I may not be Cheryl Chen, but I can put my finger into, into my nose, so I am Cheryl Chen. And uh, usually in Hong Kong, before we start the uh, teleconsultation, we usually ask the patient to present their Hong Kong ID card, the identification card in front of the camera, so that we can chat that that patient is the patient that we are seeing. And uh, it's important for us to um, secure our data storage. And also, it's great to know the tips to avoid phishing emails and hacking URLs. Um, so before we go to the Q&A session, may I ask all of you to uh, turn on your camera and we would like to have a group picture together. I can see a lot of familiar faces here. Hello. All right, so are we ready? Okay, on a count of three. One, two, three, cheers. One more time. One, two, three, cheers. Great, thank you very much. So now let's move on to the Q&A session. We already have a few uh, questions in the chat box. Um, so first of all, um. 
what is the risk of the um, multi factor authentication with biometrical data being compromised and end up being sold on the dark web? Do you have an answer to that, Mr. Ao Yan? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the question. So, um, first of all, I would like to uh highlight one thing. Um, the information, um, post on the internet. Um, you cannot remove it. I would say because, um, some in other internet users may copy it or put it into other spaces. Um. If those data were already published, you may lose the uh, control and you cannot stop others to like repost or forward and etc. So we really need to be careful um, when we put something on the internet. And then regarding the biometric uh, data on the dark web, uh, yeah, it's and other uh, headache issue because uh um head uh dark web is more difficult for the law enforcement agency to you know do the investigation or detect the cases. So, um even though sometimes um uh, we have successful cases, but uh um when comparing with the uh, open internet, it, it really um difficult to investigate. I would say. Frankly speaking, so make sure um you have good data protection, um make sure you have um um sufficient um security measures, uh such that you won't face uh those risks, and won't let it happen. So prevention is more important. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Aoyan. And as in medicine, of uh, always prevention is more than important than cure. So um, the next question is um, how uh, uh, how telemedicine will be in five years time. Um, Anna, do you want to give us some insight on this topic? Yes, very happy to. And thanks for the question, Jose Miguel. Um, Long story short, I don't know the answer. Um, I wish I knew the answer. I have a few ideas that I maybe can share with you. So, so I could see two main trends. Well, I say maybe three more trends emerging. So one trend is um, healthcare systems looking at the ways of treating patients from their homes as much as possible. And I'm bringing these because I know a few examples. Uh, so here in the UK, with what they call the virtual worlds, uh, trying to, and, and we have seen this before, like the idea of treating patients at home is not new in many countries, but it's just how we use technology to monitor them at home. So there are a few examples here in the UK, for instance, for um, respiratory infections that classically would be managed in the hospital and now are managed in the community with visits but also with monitoring so patients are monitored uh, for pulse oximetry so oxygen levels blood pressure a range of um, risk indicators so i can see a clear trend on uh, countries i know that in the uk and the us as well uh, there's a few pilots trying to deliver these home-based care digitally enhanced so patients monitored information sent to a dashboard the team looking at the dashboard and looking for alerts. So I could see a trend there and I would anticipate that to, to grow in the coming years. Um, the reason why I think it's grow, it, it will grow is because not only because healthcare providers and patients are more open to it, but also because it's a way to help us cope with uh, staff shortages and the, the, um, the constraints that we are seeing in healthcare delivery. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. The other thing uh, is, um, and we have seen this happening as well, so in the way we collect data to get some sort of decision support tools uh, tailored 
care, so to merge data from different records, but also from the wearables that patients are using. And once you get into a telemedicine consultation, you already have some sort of stratification that could be their online triage or based on data. So that's the second thing that I would see coming. So personalized care through uh, AI-based solutions. The third thing um, that I'm not sure if it's going to fly, but I would love to see flying, is uh, the use of what uh, has been called ambient listening. So a few years ago, all of us GPs got quite disrupted because we started to have this piece of hardware, a computer, sitting between ourselves and the patients. And what we are now seeing is the use of AI to actually listen, summarize, and give me that those written notes at the end of consultation that they won't be final, but they will be something that I can review in two minutes rather than spending the whole consultation with this barrier between me and the patient. So, so that's not strictly telemedicine, that's more digital innovation, but I think it's something that's going to fundamentally change the way uh, we deliver care and hopefully remove a barrier that we've been struggling with for a long time. I think we still miss looking people on the eyes and technology can do that in a kind of very elegant way to remove itself out of the way. So that's more a hope than a conviction, but but I hope to see that happening in my lifetime. And I think I will. We will all, I think. Yeah, thank you very much for your sharing, Anna. And also, yes, in our, in my hospital already, we are using AI and machine learning to help us screen chest X-ray. Um, it won't give us the final reports, but at least it can help us screen out the red flags so that the doctor can pay more attention to that particular x-ray film and go to that patient because we won't have time to go through. It takes time for us to read all, all of the films and AI can uh, help us to be more efficient. Yes. If I can be very sneaky here, uh, I, I just love this topic. Uh, and we are just discussing this recently. We are seeing these sort of tools, as you said, Ch uh, Cheryl, uh, helping with the diagnosis, but ultimately in the way we are operating, ultimately, the responsible for the for the decision or for the diagnosis is the doctor. So we start playing in a quite interesting place where technology helps, the doctor makes the call. If technology is wrong, it's the doctor's responsibility. If okay. technology is right and the doctor missed it, it's the doctor's responsibility. So I think that starts putting us ourselves as a kind of... Um, I wouldn't say medical community, but the healthcare providers in a quite uh, challenging space. So, so, so I think there's an important reflection for us to make there. So, where does responsibility and liability stands in um, AI-based uh, uh, decisions? Sorry, I didn't want to open the Pandora's box. Uh, but yeah, I yes, you're completely right. But um, I also want to add one point that I think AI will never uh, replace family medicine because we are the unique specialty that. Um, puts patient be, be, before everything else. And also we have the unique rep report with our patient and we adopt patient-centered care. So um, yeah. Um, and the next question is um, how do we report the re reach of, the breach of pa uh, patient data or any kind of uh, data bre breaching like confidentiality issue? Um, is there any, I guess it's, it differs from country to country, but is there a, any international uh, way of reporting such data breach? Um, thank you very much for the question. So it really depends on um, the law of um, different countries. For example, in Hong Kong, we have um, um, personal data privacy ordinance which is a criminal offense if you uh, publish the data, uh, personal data of others. So uh, it really varies. But um, I would say most of the countries may have similar uh, legislation to protect the personal data of the citizens. So And it would be a, a criminal offense. So the most direct method, uh, the most direct way is to report the incident to the police. So if there are any criminal elements, um, the police will start the investigation. And if necessary, um, the, the law enforcement agency would seek assistance from um, different uh, investigation units, including Interpol or um, other partners 
to uh, join the investigation. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, we have. A... Thank you so much. Uh, could I get a chance to uh, further ask another question? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Dr. Omar. I'm from Pakistan. Actually, <clears throat> in our part of the world, uh, like the rest of the countries, uh, data is very important. So if there is a breach, uh, it would be preferable that uh, uh, we doctors are given a chance to uh, internationally uh, request the authorities to, uh, you know, uh, to get in action and uh, do what is right. Because uh, data is very important and it is not right to uh, for anybody, uh, either a doctor or not that uh, their uh, patient's data is uh, uh, breached or privacy is concerned. Thank you. Hmm. Yes, um, thank you very much, doctor. Um, yes, I, I uh, echo with you. The data is very important for all of us, for the patient, for the doctor, or for the third parties, because those data may bring them benefit if they sell the data, sell the uh, they sell the data on the internet or sell the, you know, um, sell the data, sell the information to the threat actors. So um, once the data is leaked, it's really irreversible. You you cannot, you know, collect the data back because it's already open to the public. Just like you pour the water into the sea, you cannot get the water back, right? So um, preventive measure is a must, I would say. Thank you. And uh, um, regarding the criminal offenses, um, I can highlight some in, uh, examples from time to time when uh, the threat actors, they really post the personal data of others on the internet. Um, our um, personal data uh, office, as well as our law enforcement agencies like the police, will start the investigation. And sometimes we can um, identify the suspect behind and then um, makes the apprehension and then bring them to the court. And at the end, they are jailed. So some, some of the successful cases I can highlight. But as, as I mentioned once again, uh, uh, it's rare uh, Different countries may have different um, um, legislation. So it really depends. Yes, dear officer, thank you so much for your guidance. Uh, I would uh, like to add uh, some patients are uh, very sensitive regarding their data, especially, for example, if there is a case of uh, depression or uh, some other... Uh, Sorry, uh, your mute, your mute. Post to the pub, then that person uh, will suffer through uh, the rest of his life or her life. And that is an important concern. That is why police uh, plays a pivotal role. And uh, like you guided, police should be involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Susan. Hi. Um, thanks a lot for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I live and work in Switzerland. And um, I am particularly interested in having uh, your opinion, either from uh, Mr. Young, uh, Horst, or from the other panelists. Um, what do you do once you've had, for example, your entire patient data, um, uh, let's say, broken into or stolen? Because it's happened to a couple of practices in the country. And yeah, I mean, we obviously, yes, you you get the police involved, et cetera. But um, on a more concrete level, is there something that one can do um, in terms of either compensation towards the patients, I suppose financial compensation is anyway completely useless because once the stuff is gone, it's gone. Um, and the whole thing of having something actually uh, disappear, I mean, the question is uh, who has taken it and what do they decide to do with it? If it's things like <laughs> ransomware, do you recommend paying the ransom or, you know, um, those, those questions sort of come to mind. Um, uh, something that get ends up on the dark net if it gets sold to whom to whom is it going to get sold what are they going to do with the information <clears throat> these are questions that have sort of gone through several people's minds um in our country anyway because because we we've even got 
classes now supposedly to teach us and to teach staff about things that you're not supposed to open things you're not supposed to do etc to avoid it happening that's the prevention side of it but once it's happened what do you do thank you thank you very much okay thank you dr susan um so i i maybe i give my opinion in two folks the first one is about the um um uh, measures the after action so need to ask um first of all we need to think about what kind of data is leaked for example if the email address is leaked is it possible to you know um uh, tell the involved that persons and then ask them to stop using the leaked um, email address for example change a new one make sure that um the linkage between the email address and other uh, um, other things to be disconnected. For example, use a new email address for the uh, banking applications or, or billing payment, etc. Something you can change, you can amend, try to do it. Um, similarly, like the mobile phones, um, uh, you, you may change it, but sometimes you cannot avoid really um for example your personal identity um your passport information your home address that you cannot change so really we we are very hopeless at this stage because you really cannot change your id card numbers you cannot change your home address um so what we we can do as much as we can that that is one advice for me and then um, for the second fold is about investigation. So once you know um, the data is leaked, you really need to assist the, the police or other law enforcement agencies to invest, investigate. You provide information to them, um, um, the range of data or the what kind of data um, is leaked or provide them some um, sample such that they can you know uh, search from the open sea it's not easy but at least they have something to trace and um, maybe maybe if the um, law enforcement agency they have the ability to conduct open source intelligence uh, or OSIN work they may be able to find out uh, the where the data is leaked or who really actually offer such a uh, leaked data information um is tip is a very typical uh, method a typical uh, investigation method for us to find um the threat actors behind yes Thank you very much, Horace, and thank you for all of the questions and participation. Um, this brings us to the end of our CyberX FM webinar series for today, but uh, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of our distinguished speaker, Dr. Anna Louisa Nevis, Dr. Keith Thompson, and Mr. Horace Aoyun, for sharing their invaluable expertise and insights from the GP's perspectives on telemedicine to the principle of family medicines and to the tips to protect cyber uh, security and prevention of cyber crimes so as to protect our patients and also our practices. And remember, pre prevention is always better than treatment. I'm sure all of us have learned a lot. I'm pleased to also um, um, announce that we are starting to plan our next Cyber XFM webinar, hopefully in October. Uh, this upcoming session will focus on the ethical issues arising from telemedicine, as well as more practical tips and strategies to help us avoid frauds and scams. So please stay tuned to us. Uh, by um, uh, stay tuned to our Wonka YDM Facebook page and also the Wonka uh, portal for the updates on the date, time, and registration details for our next webinar. We look forward to seeing all of you there again, and I wish you all a wonderful day ahead or a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you very much for coming today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.